Well, good morning, church online and in the room. We're so glad that you chose to join us today. We are gathered here to lift Jesus high, magnify him, hold a spotlight on him, and nothing else. We invite you to do that as we worship Jesus. service. Please meet Olivia in the lobby if you are available. It will only take 20 minutes. Hey First Family, we have an awesome opportunity to partner with a gospel work in Central America. Former members and longtime friends of First Joplin, Josh and Megan Smith, will be moving their family to Guatemala to share the gospel through medical missions. We will be taking up a special offering on June 30th and July 7th to help support them. They will be here on June 30th to share about the
about the work. I hope you will prayfully consider how you might help them in this mission through prayer and financial partnership. Attention, men of First Baptist. It is time to meet again. On June 15th at 6 o'clock, we'll be meeting at the man's property for a time of fellowship, food, and obviously a lot of fun. We'll be fishing, we'll be doing a little cornhole, and obviously maybe a little horseshoes. Come join us at the man's property on June 15th. Please come over to the foyer to sign up for the event. Registration now open for first and second grade day camp. Join us as we run the great race with endurance, July 8th and 9th. Cost is $45. Register at firstjoplin.org slash summer. Our monthly prayer meeting will be June the 6th at noon in the East Room. We'll be praying for revival and spiritual awakening. Next event is June the 9th at 6 p.m. We'll be hosting Gospel Quartet True Love. So invite your friends, your family, your neighborhood. Come and enjoy a wonderful evening of gospel music. Mark your calendars for our next First Look Lunch on Sunday, June 9th. Lunch and child care are provided. Please secure your spot today and RSVP at the engaged table or email heather at firstjoplin.org. Good morning, First Baptist. How are you? Good. Hey, it's summer. Yeah. Oh. All right. I don't even, I, I do that every time. I set myself up for failure every time. Hey, just a really quick announcement. Man, I've got to meet some folks for th- that this is their first Sunday with us, so we're not going to call you out or have you share your favorite Bible verse or tell us a little bit about you or balance a hymnal on your nose. None of those things. Um, we're just glad you're here, and uh, we're just honored that you would take time to come out and be a part of First Baptist. You had to drive by a lot of good churches to get here, and we're pretty honored that you would spend your morning with us. If you are one of our first-time guests, we do definitely want an opportunity to be able to connect with you. Um, and you can do that through the connect card you'll find in the seat back in front of you, or you can scan the QR code up on the screen, and that'll take you to our online digital connect card. Um, that connect card is not just a way of being able to communicate uh, to us that so you give us a record of your visit, but it also allows us an opportunity to pray with you if you have a prayer need uh, that you want the staff to know about. Um, we can definitely you can communicate that to us on there. If you made a decision, uh, want to get connected with the group, any of those things are available on that card or on the online digital connect card. So please take advantage of that. Utilize that as an opportunity to communicate back with us. And if you are one of our first-time guests, when you're on your way out this morning, we'd love to be able to give you a gift. Uh, It's just our way of saying thank you for worshiping with us at First Baptist Church. Part of what we do on a Sunday morning on the Lord's Day is we come together, we worship, we serve Uh, We fellowship together, but we also give, and we believe giving is an act of worship. And uh, so just to give a few instructions on how we give, um, we have some plates up here along the front of the stage, and at any time during our song service, you can come up and place your tithes or offerings in that plate. Or, of course, you can use the black box back at the exit in between the two main doors there. You can place your offering in there. Of course, we also have online Um, or mail giving as well. But regardless of how we give, uh, we pray that our heart would be right, that it would be a reflection of the Lordship of God over our life, realizing that all we have is His, and we get to give back a portion uh, to His glory and honor. Quick, Two quick things to share with you. One is um, senior adults are going to be at our engaged table, uh, which is right outside, used to be the old welcome center. Uh, That's an opportunity for you if you're interested in senior adult ministries. Uh, Ken will be out there, our senior adult pastor. Uh, He'll be out there to be able to answer questions for you, to provide information, um, let you know how you can better pray for or participate in some of the awesome work that he's doing as he's shepherding our senior adults. And then don't forget, First Look Lunch is next Sunday. So if you're interested in learning more about First Baptist or or, are considering membership, we invite you, encourage you uh, to come up to the second floor of the East Room Uh, That building over there, go up and all the way to the end until you smell food, and that's where it'll be. So if you want to sign up and RSVP, that's at the Engage table as well, or you can just email the church office, and uh, we provide free lunch and free child care for all that will be there, and it typically runs about an hour. That includes lunch as well. You'll get to meet the staff. You'll get to have your questions answered. You'll get to learn a little bit about the history, mission, and vision forward of First Baptist Church, but I'm glad you're here. Um, We're going to be in Psalm 3 this morning. We're beginning a brand new series, Summer in the Psalms. Uh, So if you want to mark your Bibles in Psalm 3, we'll head there. 
right after our praise and worship section of the morning. And I'm going to ask if you would to pray with me. <clears throat> Father, we're, we're thankful that you are good and that that goodness never changes. And Father, that as your children, we can hold to the promises that never fail. It's impossible for you to fail. You will never fail. People will fail us. We will fail ourselves. Circumstances and situations will fail. But you never will. You are the only one that's qualified to be our all-sufficient Savior. And I pray this morning, Lord, as we consider the, the songs that we sing, that we would allow these songs to reflect a heart of gratitude, thankfulness, worship, and adoration of the one to whom all praise is due. And Father, as we open your word, we know that that seed is going to fall on many kinds of hearts this morning. But I pray, Lord, that our hearts would be prepared now to receive the word of God, the truth of the word of God, that, Lord, that fruit, that seed would bear fruit in our lives. Father, help us to leave this morning different than when we came in because of Christ. We love you, God. We praise you. We thank you for, for Jesus and his sacrifice on our behalf, his resurrection to prove that all things he said were true and that he is who he said he is. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's continue to worship him, church.
will be close, close to your side, yeah. so heaven is real, and death is alive, I want to hear voices of angels above, singing as one, you sing it church.
the great I am, the one true God. And God, we're so grateful we can put our hope and our trust in a God who knows tomorrow. When everything around us may seem to shake, when everything around us seems to fall, God, you are our hope. So we're going to read in this psalm, you're the lifter of our head the one who sets us apart as your children. God, we praise you this morning. It's in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. down and slept, I woke again for the Lord sustained me. I will not be afraid of many thousands of people who have set themselves against me all around. Psalms 3, 5, and 6. These verses have meant so much to me because no matter what this world brings, God is there. He will never leave me, He has never left me, and He never will. He has never left me, and He never will. What, what words of confidence we've been afforded because of our relationship with Christ, that it doesn't matter what is going on around us, what matters is who is within us. And I think Gina did a great job in a very short amount of time being able to articulate the, the, the importance and the significance that that psalm has played in her life. And this series, The Summer in the Psalms, one of the things you're going to be able to see are not just a, a willy-nilly choosing of psalms to preach from through the summer, nothing of that nature. What we're going to be doing over the course of this summer are taking uh, short testimonies of people about their favorite psalms, uh, a particular verse in the psalm or favorite psalm, and then sharing briefly about why that psalm, why that scripture means so much and has impacted our life. And there's probably, not to, not to, to take anything away from any of the rest of the scripture, but there's probably no section of Scripture that is more relatable than the Psalms. They deal with life. They, many of them are Psalms of lament, crying out to God. They represent sometimes confusion and anger. Uh, sometimes they represent praise and adoration. Sometimes they're focused on the past. Sometimes they're focused on the present of the person. And sometimes the author has the faith to be able to look forward. And I would argue that the Psalms represent a language of life. They're songs that have been written to be sung back and praised to God. Oftentimes, as we'll see this morning, we get a glimpse into someone's actual prayer journal, and we find that in Psalm 3. And the someone is none other than King David. Psalm 3 is the first psalm that actually has a superscription with the title of the, with the, name, with the name of the author in it, now, of course, the Holy Spirit is the one who has given breath to all Scripture. All Scripture is inspired by God, God breathed. But God used David to write this one. And David tells us in the superscription why. If you notice, look with me in Psalm 3. The superscription above your psalm will say a psalm of David when he fled from Absalom his son. So now we know the author and we know the context of why this psalm was written or when it was. And then join me if we, as we read these next eight verses together. O oh Lord, how many are my foes? Many are rising against me. Many are saying of my soul, there is no salvation for him in God. But you, O oh Lord, are a shield about me, my glory and the lifter of my head. I cried aloud to the Lord, and he answered me from his holy hill. I lay down and slept. I awoke again, for the Lord sustained me. I will not be afraid of many thousands of people who have set themselves against me all around. Arise, O Lord, save me, O my God, for you strike all my enemies on the cheek. You break the teeth of the wicked. Salvation belongs to the Lord. Your blessing be on your people. You can go ahead and have a seat. Thank you. Psalm of David, when he was running from Absalom. If none of those words or names mean anything to you, this is the story. David was the king, the man after God's own heart. 
God anointed him king before he ever officially became the king. Yes, this is the same David of David and Goliath fame. He rose eventually to be the king appointed by God. And after a period of time, one of David's sons, Solomon, wanted to take the throne away from his father. And over time, he started garnering the support and the encouragement and started getting the trust and the hearts of a lot of David's friends and a lot of the people in Israel. And at a point when Absalom he felt as though he had enough support, he struck at David in an attempt to get him off of the throne. And David flees Jerusalem. And we believe this psalm, as David, as the superscription says, was probably written from a cave or a pit as he was staying away from his son Absalom, who wanted his throne, who was preparing and had appointed himself as the king of Israel. Absalom also had several men that were counselors to him. Ahilophath was one of them, and he was a man who was determined. He was actually, uh, he was actually uh, Bathsheba's grandfather. Wow, that, I've been filling my, my head with names this morning, and Bathsheba left me. It was actually Bathsheba's grandfather, and, and he was coming to David, and he was giving him advice. And one of the bits of advice he gave him, and if you're a note-taker, you may jot down 2 Samuel chapter 15, 16, and 17, because that's, that gives you a little broader context of the story. But I'm going to hit some of the high points right now. He tells him, I, want you, I, want to, I can take 12,000 men, Absalom, and I can go find David, and I can strike him by night when he is weary, and the throne will be yours. There was another man named Hushai who was a friend of David's. And he came and was going to stay with David and, and live, live literally with David outside of Absalom's reign. And David told him that he wanted him to go back with Absalom and kind of be a man on the inside. He wanted Hushai to uh, kind of subdue some of the advice that he was going to be getting from his other counselors. So when Absalom hears this advice, Absalom thinks this is the best plan in the world. I'm going to get 12,000 troops. We're going to go out there. We're going to sniff out my dad. We're going to kill him, and I'm going to take the throne. Hushai said, no, that's not the best idea. You better not do that. He said, because when you come up on him, his mighty men that are with him are going to kill some, and then the people are going to see that as a loss for your army. It's better if you just find him somewhere else and then strike him. Now, even though those plans were being made, we don't think David even had an awareness at the time that those things were necessarily going on. What he knew was there was a threat and a, and a, and a price on his head from his own son. What a mixture of emotions that would have been. So David is now writing this psalm from, or at least record, or praying these prayers from this pit in the midst of trouble. And we've probably all been in a similar situation. We may not have had a rebellious child that wanted to kill us. Maybe you have. I don't know. Most of us probably haven't, but we've been in trouble. We've, we've had trials in our life. We've had difficulties. And some of those may be relational, like David had. Some of those may have come upon us out of nowhere, kind of like what David had. Some of those may not be relational at all. They may be physical. Maybe you've had some physical trials that you're going through. And maybe this morning, in a real way, you can kind of relate to being in a cave right now and, and being stuck in the midst of this situation with all of these other factors at play. You may actually be in a situation where you feel all the world is against you. Maybe there are difficulties in your job. Maybe there's difficulties in your school. Maybe your work schedule is crazy. Maybe your finances have taken a hit. Who knows? You don't have to look far to find trouble right now in life. And if we really look hard, we can find troubles in our own lives. And I think what David does in this psalm that was so meaningful to Gina and has been so meaningful to so many others, I think we're going to get an indicator of how to be able to handle the troubles that come in our life. David says, I lay down and slept. Nap sounds good, doesn't it? Does nap sound good? Are you already napping? Maybe we're already napping. Maybe we're already there. Let's look at number one, David's trouble. Even though Absalom was after him, I want to put this in context and make sure that we have a balanced view of this. Some of the trouble and trial that you go through may not have anything to do with you directly. It may not be the result of some sin or error in your life. This one is different. 
The Bible tells us that once David became king and all of his men were going out to war, David stayed behind. This is 2 Samuel chapter 11. David stays behind. He goes up on the roof of his palace. He looks out on another roof. He sees a beautiful woman bathing. He he decides at that moment that he wants to have her. He finds out that her husband is named Uriah, and Uriah is serving in the battle with David. So David sends word to send Uriah to the front line of the hottest battle so he'll be killed. And that's exactly what happens. And David takes Bathsheba to be his own. They end up having sex and they conceive a child. God says during that season, after all of that happened, David was in a spiritual spiral downward. We don't see any positive things coming from David. He was living in the guilt of that sin. Finally, God sends his man to David, Nathan. And Nathan the prophet tells David two things. One is, the sword will never depart from your family. And secondly, God says, I will raise up an evil among you. So we look at this and we see that this decision of Absalom to come and try to take his father David off of the throne was was not just Absalom's fault, though it was. It was also God saying there are consequences for your sin. So sometimes in our life, some of the trouble and trials we can get into are the result sometimes of our own doing. The consequences of our own sins or the consequences of our own faithless decisions can sometimes bring added weight and pressure to our life. And here David in this cave is crying out. And in chapter 15 of 2 Samuel, it tells us that the people were growing and starting to join with Absalom. So when David is talking about thousands there are that are out there after him, he's not lying. One of Absalom's advisors, as I said, wanted 12,000 men. But Hushai said, no, don't do it. David, in the midst of that cave, whatever that looks like for you, that place in exile, would have easily been able to feel vulnerable, would have been able to easily feel attacked and surrounded and unsure. And often those are feelings that we can experience in the midst of those trials. We can feel unsure. We can feel attacked. We might feel isolated and alone. But I want you to see how David responds in the midst of trouble, in the middle of that cave of trouble. Number two, look at David's truth. What does David do? He declares to God, there are a lot of foes. Many are rising against me. Many are saying in my soul, there is no salvation for him in God. But then verse 3, but you, O Lord, are a shield. David gives God three pictures. He sees God in three different ways, and he prays to him. That's his first step. It's not, God, I want you to wipe them out. That's not his first step. His first step is to give God praise and recite back to God who God is to David. The the point of this is, number two, is David's truth. David had a truth in which he could stand on that was giving him a proper footing no matter what was going on around him. David was able to look back to God and say, God, you are a shield about me. Think about this parallel now. Think about what David is doing. Many there are that have surrounded me. That's what David said. But now he comes to God and he says, God, you're a shield around me. If you've heard that word shield before, it comes from Genesis chapter 15. When God comes to Abraham to make his covenant, he says, fear not, Abraham, for I am your shield. What God told Abraham in the very beginning, before he told him what he was going to do, he told him who he was. And here, David is saying the same thing. God, you're my protector. You are the one that keeps me safe. He doesn't just say, God, you're my shield. He says, you're my glory. Now, the best way we can understand what David is saying is to think that David is saying, God, of anything that is good in me, it comes from you. David understood it wasn't because of his appearance that he was king. He understood it wasn't because he was a skilled musician and an excellent songwriter that he was where he was. 
he realized that he wasn't who he was or where he was because he was just skilled with a sling. He realized that behind everything in his life was this God who was working on his behalf. So he's saying, God, if there's anything good in me, it comes from you. God, if there's any good in my life, it is a result of you. God, if I have anything good, it comes from you who are the giver of all good things. God, you're my shield. God, you're my only good. And then he says, you're the lifter of my head. Lifter of my head. How do we understand what that means? Hebrew language is a beautiful language. And often what you find in the Psalms is that when God's people wanted to describe God, they would use words like holy and righteous and just. But what we find oftentimes in the Psalms is they would use pictures to describe God. You're my rock, my strong fortress. You're a tower where I take refuge. We understand, we can learn a lot about God through the pictures that they give us. If I say, if you say just, I might have my own definition of that. But a rock, that gives me a little broader context of who God is. And David says, God, you're the lifter of my head. Parents, have you ever had your child come up to you and they were sad, they were hurt, they were disappointed, embarrassed. Have you ever had them come up to you and their head was down? What did you do as a parent? The very first thing, before you ever said a word, you would take your hand very gently and put it under their chin and lift them up. You might take your hand on their forehead and lovingly pull it back. Why? Because you want to have eye contact with them. You want them to know that they have value and meaning and they are special. David could have easily meant, God, you are the one who sustains me. When I'm weary, you're the one who lifts my head. He could have meant, God, you're the one who sustains me. You give me the strength to raise my head valiantly when all of the others around me are beating me down. Maybe he's saying, God, you value me. You love me. You're looking me right in the eyes. You want to connect with me. You want me to know who I am and who you are. And you want me to know how special I am to you. Either way, I can't think of a bad scenario in this situation where David would say, you're the lifter of my head. God, you strengthen and sustain you value me, you care about me, you love me. That's what he's saying about God. When I'm weak, you're strong. When I'm down, you bring me up, you lift me up. But you, O oh Lord, are a shield about me, my glory and the lifter of my head. Those are the truths that David knew. That's what David knew about God. Now here's kind of an interesting scenario that plays out a lot of times in our Christian faith. Oftentimes, we will go through trials or challenges, and then we will go to the Word of God, right? Something bad has happened, what do we do? We throw open our Bible and we start reading. Now, don't get me wrong, that's awesome. We should always go to the Word of God, especially in times of trouble. But we have to be careful that our relationship with the Word and with the truth is not always reactive to the situations we're going through. Wouldn't it be great if in the good times... We were able to store up those truths and that wisdom and that understanding of who God is to prepare for those times before the storm comes. It would be much greater for us to know there are seven years of famine that are coming and go and glean from the Word, the truth, and warehouse it and stockpile it in our lives because when we're going through those things, we want to be able to pull from the resources that we've already set aside. And you know, in a very unselfish way, maybe in my life, in the good times, I ought to stockpile wisdom and truth of Word of God so I can help somebody else 
when they're going through challenges and trials. So I could be a source of encouragement and an extension of this God who lifts one's head. David knew the truth. He knew who God was. And then number three, look at his trust. His trust. There, are, there is a mile of difference between knowing the truth and believing the truth. And David bridges that gap. God, I know who you are. And because of that, this is what happens. How do I know David believed? How do I know David trusted? The evidence in Scripture is this. Number one, he prayed. Faith is an interesting thing, isn't it? Faith requires us to be vulnerable. It really does. Faith requires us to be vulnerable. And David was in this situation with mounting pressure all around him, his own son wanting to take away the throne, threats on his life, a, a, abandonment of his friends to his son Absalom, people misled and misguided, all of these things going on. But David was able to say, God, you're the one who has never left me. You are the one, and I know this, and he prays. I cried aloud to the Lord, and he answered me from his holy hill. The Ark of the Covenant was still in Jerusalem. David realized, I don't need the Ark to be able to reach God. He realized, I can pray, and God still hears. He understood that. Christians, let me just give you one little bit of advice. One great little life truth. Never live your life in a way that you are the reason another Christian is asking God for help. And here David is praying for people and against people, right? He's praying for them and about them. And I want to live my life in a way that nobody around me is having to ask God to help because of something I've done in their life. Because David finds himself on the right side of God. And he's able to pray with that confidence. I cried aloud to the Lord and he answered me from his holy hill. And then look at verse 5 and 6. I lay down and slept. I woke again for the Lord sustained me. I will not be afraid of many thousands of people who have set themselves against me all around. David slept. This is an actual tangible result of his comforted heart based off of the truth of the Word of God. How do I know he believed it? He slept. In the midst of the danger of his life, in the midst of the vulnerability, in the midst of all that's going on, he could sleep because he knew greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. He understood the promises of God and he was able to claim those for himself. Now this sleeping is not the kind of sleeping that we find in Romans 13 that is a spiritual laziness. This is not that kind of sleeping. This is not the kind of sleeping that the disobedient prophet Jonah did in the bottom of the ship in the midst of the storm. No. This is that precious sleep of a comforted mind, a clear conscience, and a content heart. David understood, I can lay down right here where I am in the midst of this cave. Because I know who God is, and I know who I am to God. I know what God's Word says, and I'm going to stand on this. There are 13 Psalms. Nearly every one of them is found in the first book of the Psalms. Psalms are arranged in books. Thirteen psalms are not just ascribed to David, but have a description of the events taking place in his life. And almost all of them take place in that first book. It seems as though when you read the psalms that they weren't just put in there willy-nilly wherever they wanted them to be. When this songbook was put together, it was put together meticulously. We see evidence of forethought and arrangement of the Psalms. And it almost seems like when you read through that first book of the Psalms, the first 71 Psalms, it almost seems like it follows the life of David 
from the early years to the later years. Which is interesting. Because why in the world would this psalm be found so early in the collection of psalms? Why would Psalm 3, the event of Absalom's rebellion that happened on the latter part of his kingship, why in the world would this be found so early? I think there's a really good reason. Why wouldn't it be after Psalm 51? Psalm 51 is David's prayer of confession over his sin with Bathsheba long before this happened. Why didn't 3 happen where 51? And why didn't 51 get where 3 is? Think about the arrangement. Psalm 1 is called the gateway psalm. By understanding Psalm 1, we are able to better understand all of the rest of the psalms. And in Psalm 1, there are two paths. The path of the righteous and the path of the wicked. David talks about, the psalmist talks about the path of the righteous. How he loves the word of God. He does not listen to the counsel of wicked men. That's the path of the righteous. He is like a tree planted by the waters. Its fruit never grows bad. Its leaves are always green. Never withers. That's Psalm 1. Psalm 2 is the kingly psalm. Psalm 2 doesn't have a superscription of David, but in Acts chapter 4, the apostles attribute Psalm 2 to David. And in Psalm 2, that kingly, prophesying psalm about Jesus that's coming up is written by David. And what David says is this, you are the king and I am the king. You are the ultimate king and I'm the one that's anointed. What David understood in Psalm 2 was that to mess with God's anointed king was to mess with God. Think about why this psalm is placed here. David's writing from a cave where his kingship is being attacked. His son is risen in rebellion. His life is in danger. Psalm 3 fits perfectly. David could say, I'm walking in the path of righteousness. I've checked myself. I know my heart. I'm living for God. I'm seeking to honor God. I'm on the right path. And God, I'm still the king. You are the one who anointed me and made me the king. I know who I am. And because of that, I know your promise about the king. David was able to check those things off in his life. David was able to pray with confidence and sleep in the midst of a cave, in the midst of this place, to trust that God was aware, God was protecting, God was doing what God does. And then look at four. Number four, David's triumph. Arise, O Lord, save me, O God, for you strike all my enemies on the cheek and you break the teeth of the wicked. You know what, God, what David's saying? God, you're going to knock their teeth out. Arise, O Lord. Several parallels here. David starts this psalm out by saying, many are arising against me. Now he's saying, God, you arise. God, they're standing up. Now it's time, God, you stand up. Do what you're going to do. By the way, I don't know if it was intentional or not. It would almost seem too painful to be intentional. But I can't help but see a connection when David says, God, you're the lifter of my head. For those of you that don't know, David's son Absalom was not to be touched, was not to be harmed. David gave his men word, do not harm Absalom. And Absalom, on his mule, saw some of David's servants. And in chapter 18 of 2 Samuel, it says that Absalom took out after David's servants. And the mule led him under a tree, and Absalom's head got caught in the oak, and he hung there. And some of David's men came and shoved spears into Absalom and killed him. I can't help but see the parallel, whether intentional or not, that even though this situation 
was a consequence for David's previous sin, Absalom still had to pay the price for his rebellion against God's anointed king. Friends, I think that there are three questions we should always ask ourselves in the middle of trial, in the middle of trouble, and the first question is this, am I right with the Lord? Am I right with the Lord? What do we want to do in the midst of trouble? We want to focus on everybody else. We want to diagnose their spiritual condition. We have a hard enough time diagnosing our own spiritual condition. What makes us think we can be spiritual doctors on other people? But that's what we want to do. We want to focus on the wrong they're doing. What if we approached it differently? What if we went and said, God, am I right with you? God, is there sin in my life? Is there besetting, continual, habitual sin in my life that needs dealt with? God, is this refining fire intended to reveal something about me that I have kept hidden and covered up? That's the first question. Am I right with God? I say, I say that if you're not a believer, if you've never started that relationship with Christ, that's the first place to start because you're not right with God. Every lost person is not right with God. Every lost person is an enemy separated from God because of our sinfulness. That's what the Bible tells us. The only way we can have peace with God, who is our enemy, is through Jesus Christ, the reconciliation that He brought on the cross for us. The only way to have peace with God is through a personal saving relationship with Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins. But even though we may be a believer, we may still walk in besetting habitual continual sin that can bring about consequences in our lives. So we pause. God, am I right with you? Second, do I know his truth? Do I know that what God says about me? Do I know who God is and what his plan is? Do I know his nature and his character? Have I been storing up wisdom and understanding and knowledge about who God is for such a time as this so I can put it into practice in my life? God, am I right with you? Second, God, do I know your truth? And thirdly, do I believe your truth? I, we, we often want to say that it's going to be easy to put those into practice, but it's not. The gap that is between knowing and believing or knowing and practicing is wide because it's hard. It is difficult at times to put our faith in God and to trust in His Word. And sometimes the, the enemies around us seem so much greater. Do I believe His truth? It is that question, if answered correctly, can unlock the prison doors of fear. It can unlock those mental chains that we have on our mind and, and can cause us to sleep because we know that God cannot nor will He ever lie. So God, am I right with you? God, do I know your truth? And God, do I believe your truth? We live what we believe. If I want to know what I believe, I need to look at my life because that's really what I believe. And if I really look at my life, it's going to reveal whether I trust God or not by the decisions, the actions, reactions, and interactions I have with others. Are you right with the Lord? Do you know His truth? This morning, it may be that you, that you may be taking your first step toward Jesus. You may be in the midst of a pit. You may be in the midst of a child. You may be an enemy of God this morning, but you can walk out of here a friend of God through the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross by faith. Do you know His truth? Maybe this morning it's a recommitment to God to say, God, I really don't know Your truth that well. I've always depended on other people. But this morning, God, I want to know Your Word for myself. I want to find a Bible plan, a Bible reading plan. I want to meditate. I want to memorize. I want to journal. I want to do something to get the intake of the Word into my heart. And do I believe it? God, right now when all the world around me is showing me one thing, do I believe what Your Word says regardless of anything else? God, do I know who You are and who You say I am. Those are big questions. Those are big questions. And I pray we're able to find the answer for those questions today. How do we get through trouble with God? That's the only way. Father, this morning, we're reminded probably, I'm sure, of caves that we've been in, of trouble that we've been in. But Father, I'm grateful that regardless of the scene around us, every born-again believer 
has the presence of God inside of us in the person of the Holy Spirit. Father, we're thankful for the peace that is available to us. Your peace. You promised us in the Gospel of John you would give us your peace. You promised us that you overcame the world and because of that we can lie down and sleep. So I pray tonight for those that have yet to take that step towards Christ, a forgiving, loving, kind Savior, compassionate and long-suffering, that there wouldn't be no hesitation as your spirit works to draw people to you. I pray, Lord, that today would be the day that that soul finds their home and their peace with God through Jesus Christ. For us as believers, Father, may we be prepared today for the storms of tomorrow. May we thatch our roof now before the storm comes in preparation. Father, we love you and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. You stand with me. I have counselors along the front. We want an opportunity to pray with you. If you're taking your first steps toward Jesus, I'm going to invite you to come during this song. Never trusted Christ, this is the time to come and find one of our counselors. Let them pray with you and lead you. Maybe you just want time to pray or a recommitment. That's what this time is for.
of Jesus. God bless you as you do. Thanks for joining us for service this morning. If you made any decisions or would like to talk to someone, please contact the church office. We look forward to meeting you in person.